Okay, all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started one minute early. Uh, we have 45 minutes and the time's going to fly by. This is a really exciting topic, so um, thank you for being here. And um, just a, a real quick uh, intro, make sure you're in the right room. Uh, this is the panel, Implementing Methods for Reducing Bit Rates While Retaining Quality. Uh, really, I, I think an extremely uh, relevant topic for what is going on right now in video. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just an amazing panel. So without, I guess as they say, further ado, uh, I'll introduce myself and then I want to give uh, time for each of the panelists to uh, introduce themselves and their companies. And then we're going to launch into, I think, a really, um, you know, sort of a fireside chat if you will, and uh, we're inviting you into our living room. So uh, this will be good. So my name is Mark Donegan. I'm with a company by the name of Beamer. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, we're uh, one of the pioneers, actually, of content adaptive uh, video technology. Uh, we acquired a company by the name of Vanguard Video last year, 2016. And um, we have a line of uh, HEVC encoders, H.264 encoders, bitrate optimizers. So um, we have a lot of experience in this topic. And uh, with that, uh, Prem, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is uh, Prem Bangali. I, I work for uh, Gogo, sometimes uh, Gogo Air, Gogo in flight. It's all the same company. Uh, we had a Wi-Fi on, on the plane uh, company. That's, that's, that's where we started. But uh, with, with multiple devices being cared, I think there was an interest where people wanted to stream, um, you know, TV or or be it a VOD content. I think that's that's where uh, the focus was. We we already had some hardware installed on the plane, and we we took this use case where you could stream to your um, uh, OTT, uh, and uh, you know, um, and bitrate, um, you know, is is very relevant for us because uh, we don't want to compromise on the quality, but the pay, the con the cost you per megabyte you send on the on the link is very relevant for us and then we, we try to uh, balance those uh, two, two together so Samir hi my name is Samir I'm chief architect at Fandango um, a lot of you may know Fandango obviously for selling tickets but um, they also acquired a company called Emgo which is a, a TVOD um, service we rebranded to Fandango now uh, and has a ton of video related uh, projects underway, like movie clips. Um, they also, Fanag also owns uh, Rotten Tomatoes, also owns Flixster, um, has also expanded into South America as well in, the, in both the ticketing and the video space. Um, so, um, you know, we were one of the first, um, a lot of work we've done uh, in the video space, um, one of the first to do 4K HDR along with Netflix and Amazon uh, in the market space. Um, also one of the first to do really like a uh, big prototype to the Beamer, Beamer video on optimizing our videos uh, and seeing some of, the, some of the results around that. Um, at the moment, you know, we're looking at uh, optimizing even further our streams. You know, when somebody pays $15 for a movie, you know, they expect to have the best quality they can get. At the same time, um, you know, there, there's a lot of interference going on, there's a lot of um, device issues, um, video issues, network bandwidth issues. So, we're always trying to find that right compromise, um, not not really between quality, but more of cost. Um, just as, as, as Prem, Prem said, it's about cost at the end of the day. Like, how do we how do you make that video delivery more efficient, you know, less less costly, and still um, still the consumers have the best possible experience? Uh, Jeremy Morrison, I head up the sales engineering team over at, at Deluxe. Uh, Deluxe is a very large company. We we do. A lot of creative services. If, if anyone saw uh, Guardians of the Galaxy this weekend, you know you've, you've seen some of our work. Uh, we also do a lot of technical services, um, work for in HDR and 4K for mastering for digital cinema distribution. Uh, we do a lot of localization work for Netflix and iTunes and the studios. I, I come from, or I, I work in what's known as the deluxe delivery team, which are really technical services for studios and for MVPDs and for OTTs. So we are. The, the group that I'm a part of, for example, um, aggregates content directly from studios or from cable nets, uh, it compresses that content, and then in certain environments, sometimes we publish it to our own origin for streaming out to consumers, sometimes we publish it into an MVPD's environment. So 
for example, you know, Charter is one of our large customers. We, we aggregate all of their VOD content. We, publish, we create all of their ABRs, and we publish it into their environment. So that's, they have unique needs when we're going you know, over a closed QAM network. We um, support customers like STARS. Where if you, you know, everything for STARS OTT app, we're, compress, you know, we're aggregating and compressing and, and then streaming all of their content. We have a few other OTT players that we do that for as well. So um, o always needs for all of those customers, whether it's on a private network or a public network, to look at how, how can they continue to compress, compress content, minimize their infrastructure or their operations costs across those environments, and still maintain quality out to customers. Awesome. Thank you. And um, just a quick note, Daniel Sanders from Verizon regretfully was double booked, so um, he's not joining us. Uh, he sends his apologies. I, I want to start with, um, I, I think this is just an amazing cross-section as you were doing your introduction. I it was thinking about the, um, uh, the, the user base that each of you represents and, you know, um, uh, the use cases. So I can't think of, uh, we all know that mobile uh, traffic is growing, mobile is expensive, everybody's head nods, right? But I think, you know, you mentioned the cost of streaming onto an airplane 30,000 feet in the air and doing that at high quality. I can't imagine what the cost differential is. It must be much higher. You know, meanwhile, you've got, you know, premium uh, transactional VOD, Samir, and then you've got you know the studios represented, and of course they operate a range of services, right? The Deluxe Absolutely. is supporting. Um, I'd like to start with with you know, and whoever wants to take it, and then we'll kind of just you know we'll, we'll bounce this question around. But the question is, you know, from your um, seat, you know, where each of you sit, you know, what. A, you know, describe the challenge and, and both the need for reducing bitrate but retaining quality, but some of the challenges that come with that. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll make, you know, give, give a quick example. Um, you, you know, one challenge is if you're a, a studio, right, you're cost sensitive and yet there's a certain quality bar, you know, that has yeah, to be absolutely. met. So that means certain technologies you could not use, whereas, you know, Prem is working under a different set of constraints. So. Sure. Whoever wants to start, so I'll, I'll start with you know one of the first use cases that Deluxe had for for this type of technology is a lot of the box set uh, mastering that we did for, that we do for for Blu-ray discs, where because of you know using a, a technology that lets us maintain quality while reducing bit rate on some of the series that we create, we can actually save a disc or two. And you think bits are expensive, you know, publishing an extra disc for, for box sets is you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on, on each one of those environments. Um, one of the other, you know, when we look at costs of reducing bit rates, a lot of our customers who you know, are, are really coming to us saying, okay, is now the time to switch, not for 4K, but even for our HD content to HEVC. And you know, we're, we're starting to help them do that analysis. Okay, here, if you go to HEVC, you're still talking about a limited set of devices. Now you're looking at encoding in AVC and HEVC and all the storage costs for both of those, as opposed to, you know, if there's a way to maintain at least your HD content in AVC, but do compression such that it's still a single encode that can go across your base, that, that starts to be, a, that's very attractive to a lot of our customers, which is why we've been, you know, exploring going down this route. Yeah, I was going to jump in and say, you know, the 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 quali quality. Obviously, you know, everybody everybody looks at the quality of the movie um, as you get it, but um, the cost associated to creating those files. And when you look at specifically on the TVOD side, when you see so much of that, you know, the, the the actual transaction fees back to the studio. Obviously, like you know, margins are obviously very thin. Um, when you need to support the infrastructure. Um, that's behind it, the streaming, the delivery infrastructure, how you uh, received the file, you encoded the file, you packaged the file, you're hosting the file in origin, then the streaming cost. And then also the multiple times that that movie gets streamed over the lifetime, right? So it's not yeah. even one time. You know I mean, um, movies, like kids' movies, right? Like <laughs> they get streamed like hundreds of times, right? And so you're really like trying to, you know, you're trying to you know, find those pennies where you can, you know, really add, add up less cost. And that's where you want to become way more efficient. And, to do that, you know, we, we, we've used a lot of different techniques. We've, we've gone with the um, pre-configured settings for some movies out of the box, like you know, some, some cool tools like FFmpeg has presets for, mm -hmm. uh, for tuning the movie, if it's an animation, if, it's, if it has grain. And so you know, that was kind of the you know, a very you know, manual, static way of setting that, that kind of um, additional compression, to, you know, to, to compress more like animation movies. You can compress a little bit more, things like that. 
and then we're getting more into today into the world of more what may, dynamic encoding, um, you know, and, that, and that's what that's what's breaking through at the moment. And I think uh, a lot of you know, there's a lot of companies out there in the space moving forward. Uh, just just getting a live content or, or any streaming content on the plane, uh, there's just sort sort of a challenge where installing new gear on the plane is just ch is so much of a challenge, right? So you, you there's a long lead time when you when you get that done, but by, by doing so, the efficiencies are really, you know, uh, upfront where you uh, you get the best bang for the buck by making sure uh, you've compressed it to the right format, but just not to the format where you know you can you can transport it, but the, ultimately the, the the end user device has to decode it. Um, you know, uh, that's that's the, that's been a greater challenge, and uh, we we do have two products, uh, the VOD and the and the live TV. Uh, both set two interesting different challenges because one is a more time-based uh, um, you know response and the, the other one is efficiency right so we got to balance both of them uh, but but by by understanding this these uh, customer base and the installed device base and, and just like mark was alluding to like uh, you know in 2013 or 2014 we saw mobile traffic had taken over um, any other device like laptop or, 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 or tablet for the matter or, or so along those lines I think uh, you know uh, we had a large heterogeneous device mix and and then you had to satisfy all these devices uh, combination that posed an interesting challenge um, and and our workflows were you know different based on different product lines you know we had to divide by saying hey let's tackle this problem on the VOD side first and and then on the, on the, on the um, live gear so by not, um, you know, uh, by not adding any more equipments, right? So on the plane, uh, when you're flying, uh, uh, you know, at, at 35,000 feet and, and then uh, 500 miles an hour, you need a uh, you need a remote uh, a satellite antenna, which is just tracking the satellite. And also, when you fly out of coverage zone, you know, how do you uh, uh, make sure that uh, with, the, with the bit rate, the passengers are having a, you know, a seamless viewing experience. So those are the challenges which you know which we, we've tried to tackle, and and I think uh, you know we'll, we'll talk more as, as as we progress. So yeah, absolutely. Your VOD is that content stored on the plane, like on local hard drives? Yes, it's it's uh, yeah, just as as I was alluding. I think we built Wi-Fi on the plane. Um, the gear was already available. We had some storage space in there. What do we do with the storage space? We decided to, um, you know, move content, which is sure. uh, you know, uh, encrypted, uh, you know, VOD, DRM content, and then a player, which is downloadable uh, on the plane. We would enable a iTunes or, or for uh, Google, um, you mm -hmm. know, the, the Play Store, you know, player was available on, on on board the aircraft, and you can you start streaming movies yeah. instantly. So. Interesting. So my my next question, I'm going to start start with you, Prem. Um, you know, there's if we think about ways to implement content adaptive uh, optimization techniques. Um, you know, I think of you know there's the manual, so that would be Jeremy like what Deluxe would do with the Blu-ray title, where mm -hmm. there's a human compressionist, highly skilled, able to squeeze out every bit, produce an awesome title, and that works for Blu-ray, but it doesn't work for us in the streaming world, right? Sure. Just you know. Absolutely. So there's that approach, but that for the I'm assuming all of us in the room, you know, that's that's not a practical or feasible. There is the Samir. You mentioned the category approach, where you say, okay, I have my animation, um, you know, recipe and action and drama, so, so on and so forth. Um, and you know, and I'm assuming on the encoding side, perhaps you know, GoGo is even you know applying some of the categorization. But um, uh, Prem, I'm curious, uh, you know, are you doing anything device specific? Or, and if you are, can you talk about how, what you're doing, you know? And if you are saying, hey, this device has a different set of characteristics and I can create kind of a different recipe then. Sure. Um, device specific, not, not so much, but um, broadly, a um, couple categories on the device specific side. One is, uh, you know, passengers carrying their own uh, devices like iPad or, 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 or tablets or their phones for the matter. But the second specific is a seat back, like it, this is the device which is on the back of the seat, mm -hmm. right? So they have a, a different profile. These are little older devices, right? Um, so that's the two challenges which we have. But, but some of these devices, they have 
power attached to them, so which is good. So you know, it's it's not the same problem as as you would see of draining power on on your uh, passenger carry devices, right? Um, but along those lines of the categorization, which you suggested, um, what what we do is you know we try to. Uh, use HEVC encoding, and we, we use something called stat statistical multiplexing. So we, we are betting on the fact that not every channel which we send on live TV on the plane is going to have a need for high bandwidth, right? So there's there's going to be like, if somebody's watching Sports Center, but not a lot of scene changes. There's a sport sports game happening in, in a different channel. Uh, these channels compete for resources or bandwidth within the allocated. Um, you know, uh, capacity to that uh, to that live TV stream. So that way, you may see adaptive, uh, you know, quality change um, per per channel. But ultimately, I think uh, you, you don't need so much uh, bit rate when, when you're watching a sports center because it's the, the scenes are not changing. So the Statmux has really helped us in that aspect, and and we also try to use HEVC. Um, you know. Uh, we don't get into the royalty or or, or the challenge yeah. there because we we have only 4,000 nodes so far on the plane, so so uh, we don't have that challenge of the the cost. That's right. So. Yeah, and we we won't talk about the royalty issues <laughs> of HEVC, but um, uh, Samir, um, you know, so what was your or what is what is your approach with categorization and how you're utilizing tools? Yeah, we started out, um, you know, we had some ideas around very, when we were about four or five years ago, we started out actually creating uh, device specific profiles, right? And, yeah. And we quickly realized that that was way too costly um, to maintain and that, you know, as we ended up with, you know, smooth streaming, dash, you know, multiple by DRM types and fair play yeah. and like we, we just ended up with so much, it just was so costly to, to create and produce that we dropped it and went with a standard set of, uh, a set, a set of layers basically um, that, that fits everybody. Um, and then, you know, once we got past that, we tried to get a little bit smarter each time. Um, so we had a, a, a single uh, set of values that we'd pass into the encoding. Um, and then as we got a little bit smarter, we, were, we were enabled, the, enabled the operators as we, as we kind of, you know, the files are incoming from the studios we would apply a preset um, onto each of these films. And, and so we would have an operator kind of you know, manually decide like, hey, this is an animation movie, X, Y, and Z, uh, other, other parameters we're gonna set. And that would kind of make its way out. Um, and we'd also send some information along to the player um, about what kind of profile is being set so that we can adapt uh, more aggressively as well um, as needed. That's interesting. And you know, Jeremy, kind of a, uh, slightly different angle on sort of the same question. So um, for those that aren't familiar, and I assume most people are familiar with Deluxe, but there's probably some who aren't because you're often doing the studio services sure. sort of, sort behind of behind, the scenes. Yeah, behind the scenes, exactly. Well, and you have that little red circle at the end of each movie. That's right, and that's right. And yet, stay till the end. Uh, yeah, when you go see a movie, yeah. you're watching Deluxe. <laughs> when you watch a Blu-ray <laughs> disc from pretty much any of the major studios, you're, you're this is Deluxe. So um, the, the, the point in making this point is that you, you're involved in sort of the epitome, typically, of quality, you know, for whatever the format sure. is. Um, I'm curious because, um, and, and so I'm asking a question I already know the answer to, but I want you to, to tell the audience. You know, um, studios are, are um, you know, there's golden eyes in studios, and they are, to say they're opinionated is an understatement about where there's quality. So you start talking about bit rate reduction, and you start talking about making files smaller. Sure. They don't necessarily open you, with, you know, welcome you with open arms, right? So. How have you, and yet, you mentioned Warner Brothers is, you know, is, is using even like our technology, so studios are adapting techniques. So what's your experience and, you know, how you've gotten some of those folks over the hump or how they, you know, or even why sure. they've adopted it? Sure. But the, the, the why is, is pretty straightforward, yeah. you know, cost. Cost is, is, you know, number one driver in a lot of this. You know, we, we deal with 4K uh, source files these days coming in at 13 terabytes. You know, as, as a, a, a true image-based uh, 4K master coming across the board, you know, all the way down, and, and we compress that all the way down to a few megabits, you know, as, as it's leaving the building. And you know, what what we have generally found it, you know, it depends depends whose name's on it. So if it's if it's a Warner Brothers Blu-ray disc that's going out, they certainly want to come in and make decisions themselves and set their own encoding parameters. If it's you know, we when we service a, a cable MVPD. They come in and they do their own settings and they they create their own code parameters. Our OTT providers, we we certainly have a standard set, 
that you know we've right. we've tested across a lot of different devices and we can stand behind. But you know, everybody wants to fine tune by, by a couple of bits here or there. But again, then, then they're all coming to us and saying, how, how can we further enhance right. this to, to further reduce our bandwidth and, and save costs? And you know, we're, we're trying to now help them look at it on you know, really getting into that, that business discussion. So uh, I, I, don't I don't believe that any of our providers have, a, have, a not, have all of their content viewed so much that it's worth compressing, you know, doing an extra compression and optimization on every piece of content that they have. So now how many times does something have to be viewed in order for it to be worthwhile to do the extra encoding optimization to save that amount on the public OTT you know, environment or on, on the private? And then the, more, the larger the operator they are, the cheaper their CDN rate. So the more that kind of offsets what that cost break off is. But you know, we're kind of playing with a number. You, know, you get to something that's viewed four to 5,000 times on, in an OTT environment it's worth taking extra steps to compress it to save that 30% on it. Something that's a couple of hundred times or less than that number, it's probably not worth ever touching it. Let it, let it keep passing through at its cheap basis. You know, old legacy content that's already on the system, you know, except for maybe your animation or things that will be viewed again and again, or your Star Wars flex, you know, let it just sit there and continue to be in its, its environment. But that's, that's where we're trying to take this, not you know, so it, it's the technology, it's then getting approvals for it, which most of the studios kind of say, hey, as long as you're doing the same thing with our content that you're doing it with everybody else, then it's, it's pretty much okay. Right. Um, but then it's, it's you know, ultimately down to the business of what do we want to do what to. That's right. That's so amazing. I'm, I'm smiling. The four to 5,000 number, and you yeah. have no idea, because at least I've never discussed this number with you. That's exactly our analysis. Really? We found, we found the break, yeah, is about four or 5,000 where there's ROI. And yeah. so, it, you know, if you have any titles getting more than four or 5,000 plays, you optimize it. So, yeah, very, very interesting. So, uh, moving this discussion along, um, it, you know, there's of always future codecs, right? There's better technology. And, you know, many of us in the room and, you know, all of us up on the, you know, on the panel here are involved in various ways of even, um, um, you know, developing or testing or, you know, these technologies, whether that's, you know, VP9, whether that's, you know, HEVC, et cetera. Um, it could be said, but what if we just hold out? Because in a couple years, and I'm not even going to name the Kodak, but, you know, <laughs> fill in the blank is going to be here, and that's going to solve all of our problems. They promise 50, per, you know. I, how do you guys think about this and your respective businesses? Because I and I know very well, you know what you're all doing. So you're both operating services, but yeah, you're at the same time responsible for looking, you know, to the future. So whoever wants to take it first, and I want to hear from all three of you. Um, how, how you handle this? You know, the tension of I have to operate a service today, but I, yeah. you know, there are going to be better technologies in the future. We, we use it as one of our main selling points for why you want to, you know, don't buy gear anymore. Go, go to a managed service provider like us because tomorrow we'll implement the next, tech, next technology and redo your library and it's going to keep changing so often. Um, but we're, you know, our, our customers are generally driven by that trade-off. Uh, they don't own the hardware at the end. They're not Apple. You know, it's not, it's not their devices. That they're, they're, some, they're limited to what can be supported across as many devices as they want to go to. They're, they're not interested in proprietary, that they've got to do multiple encodes for multiple types of devices. It's, it's still bad enough they've got to package multiple times. Yeah. Um, so you know, we're, we're seeing our customers really stay with AVC with um, their HD content, and, and almost all of them are saying HEVC as we go, to, go into 4K. Uh, but we haven't. We don't have a, a single person we're working with in direct streaming who's really looking at, at anything outside of those two options. Yeah, and that's what we went with as well. Um, you know, uh, we, we, we continue to do all of our HD and SD content in, uh, in AVC, and then um, everything else, uh, all our 4K HDR content now is in HEVC. Um, just as, that's where you see the, you know, the big economies, right, like uh, of, of that side. I think one of the things that, back to Mark's question was, you know, you can't just stop innovating. Um, it's, it's a really hard thing. Like, if you stop, you, it's very hard to catch up. Um, you know, you, you fall behind in, in your workflow, you fall behind in, um, you know, in the tools you're using, and you become complacent, right? And then getting, getting caught up, and even if you, like, if you miss a generation, 
it's very, very hard to catch up after that. Like, and you'll always be, you know, you'll be struggling to catch up uh, with whatever technology it is, and you know, it ends up, you know, not in your hands anymore. You could miss strategic opportunities and things like that. I think change is permanent. Uh, no, no matter what, uh, there will be better uh, codecs, better. Uh, you know, systems available. You, you just, just like to add on to Samir's point, you can't just stop. Um, there's a couple of ways to peel the orange, for, especially for Google. Um, one is increasing the bandwidth of the plane, which we're working on. The second way is, you know, decreasing the bit rate by not compromising the quality. Uh, both go hand in hand. Uh, by doing so, uh, you, either you provide the channel lineup exceeds uh, what, what we provide today, so there's always spare capacity available which we can um, you know, uh, let uh, more channels to be added, or that uh, utilization, uh, that, cha that uh, capacity could be used for something else, like the analytics on the plane, right? So how is the player performing? How is, um, you know, how is the user experience, the quality of experience, I would, I would say. Uh, today, we are, we're sort of uh, inventing ways where you know, we cut corners there and, 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 and try to see, uh, yeah, uh, I think the, the user experience is good, but we need a little more, a little more of a, uh, handshake method. I think all those will really help um, in the way the, the, the technology is progressing as well. And also to add to that, I think when you when you try to um, bring in the new codec, uh, the challenge it puts on the computing um, platforms which we have, um, I, I think some of them are, are trying to out innovate them as well. So it's a challenge for them. It's just not a challenge for for Google, who's just uh, you know who's a service provider. So I, I would say this is yeah. this is a this is a race, and I think you got to stay in it and st uh, you know try to beat the market so absolutely yeah so you know prem i i would like your perspective in terms of user experience there's different ways to measure it and and, and again you know go back down the line because i know uh, samir you know we've we've done work with you you know even at emgo a case study around rebuffering and and things like that but how do you measure um you know, user experience. What are the metrics that, that are most important to you at GoGo? Um, you know, when you're evaluating whether you know you're you're delivering what you want to or not. Uh, and then let's let's go down the. Um, sure. Um, you, you know, uh, the quality of uh, service in, in terms of like choosing the right encoding platform uh, and also the technology, uh, AVC or HEVC. I think half the problem is solved there. Once you do that, I think. Um, uh, you, you have the standard set, set of parameters, bitrate, uh, drop frames, w whatever be it, right? So uh, I, I think uh, uh, we, we talked about um, uh, the visual equity, which is more important. And you could have all the quality of service parameters could be could be good, but then visually, you know, yeah. doesn't make sense, right? So I think um, I, I see uh, Beamer is doing some work there. Um, th that's very important as well, but. Um, you know, we use a, a, a mean um, observation scale yeah. mass metric uh, to measure based on uh, different ingest points, you know, within our network. Mm -hmm. And then because we have heterogeneous network, we, we do have uh, handoff points, different satellite, right? And also, there are certain nodes which diagnostically listen to these broadcast signals come back, and then they will try to interpret pretty close to what happens on the plane. Uh, we don't have the last edge uh, node to the device figured out, but we're, we're, we're working on that. That's the piece which I was suggesting that we need a little more analytics and, and you know, handshake in terms of like how, how it works. Uh, but yeah, um, the, uh, the, SI, um, the SSIS, all those are, are, are metrics which, you know, we make sure that we choose, uh, you know, sure. uh, uh, the right metric and, uh, and, and I think um, uh, there's, there's work to be done there, so. Yeah, and on the on the TVOD side, it really is a lot. I mean, we use the average, you know, standard metrics, average bit rate, you know, drop frames. We also look at kind of um, the 95th percentile of what was used, like which layers we used the most in in that regard. And then, you know, then when we look at that, we try and look at who's using it, right? Which type of devices are using it more than others? Like, you know, we definitely know that in the living room at home, like, you know, this is where you're getting that, you know, five, six megabits, seven megabits per second for HD. And you know, well above 10 megabits per second for uh, for the for the UHD content. It's you know, and then we, then we try and figure out like how do we, you know, what, what what can we do to implement different solutions? And you know, there's there's a lot of other things we're looking at as well. Like you know, 
um, better you know, last mile delivery, like switching CDNs on the fly, things like that, and then um, you know, optimizing the video itself by category. Yeah. Sure. I mean, we, we, we have a number of golden eyes you know, in, yeah. in, in the facility that, depending on the type of work that we're doing for different customers, are, are helping to make decisions. Um, but, but a lot of what we do, because it's not ultimately a deluxe label on, on the product, it's, it's our customers' labels on their you know, na name and brand, it's, it's testing that generally they do and, and make those decisions and play in their own way. And I, I, I yeah, I, I don't have a good sample set of, of exactly how they're, they're going through and making those decisions. I assume very similar to what you guys are saying, which, where it is your name on it. But would you would would everyone basically agree that like rebuffering in terms of metrics that you really would mm -hmm. care a lot about rebuffering and start time stream start time is yeah I, I'm amazed how few of our how few of our customers actually have the ability to measure any of that that they have no idea what their standard bit rates are out to their devices they're, you know, they're, they're a lot of them are locked into storefront platforms that don't offer you know, the, those types of analytics packages and, and they're, they're guessing, you know, the mm -hmm. customer complaints. So I, I think as they start to, as, as it becomes more prevalent, they'll start to have more of that data and that'll drive back to making other decisions. That's interesting, yeah. How is the, um, you know, I'm, I'm struck that at both, you know, Jeremy, you know, and Prem, I know both of you are delivering live content, right? I mean, of course, VOD deluxes, but you're preparing live streams, correct? For um, some of your for your MVPD customers, not, not as much. Not as much. Not okay, as much. but 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 my question and every, everybody participate. Uh, what is the difference, you know, between VOD mm -hmm. and live? I'll go. Um, <laughs> so, I think just I was alluding in the in the beginning. I think uh, live um, the timeliness matters, right? So um, you, you got to get the uh, get the uh, the content, you know, within a certain uh, specified interval, otherwise it's useless, right? So, um, but for VOD, I think efficiency matters. So you you have um, you, you can get multiple passes at trying to encode the content so that it's it's efficient, right? And That's then right. Yeah. it's got to fit the storage or whatever that need is, right? Uh, you get multiple passes at it, but here um, the live is is it's like timeliness. So uh, so one platform. Uh, what you choose for encoding or decoding may not work the best way, or you may have to tweak the profiles. It's 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 a it's a different uh, uh, you know mindset in terms of tuning. Um, you know, a lot, oftentimes uh, you know I, I hear my management say, "That's a deploy." It's like, no, we we got to keep <laughs> deploying, um, making better. And and I think that's where uh, our challenge is to go back and say, "Yeah, um, what what we did for this airline." or this customer is going to be a little different and then you know but to go back to your point i think uh, uh, I, I think the timeliness is, is, is what uh, lets to choose the, the the encoding platform sure. or, uh, or or for that matter the downstream processing so. sure sure so I, I would talk to the difference between maybe live to vod quick turn content versus traditional vod and i would say there are on, on traditional VOD content, there is more of that concern about efficiency and quality, and you, you have time to process it. And it's going to live on a system for an extended period of time. Live to VOD content is it's how quickly you can get it out there, mm -hmm. how, how much revenue you're going to get off the advertisements that are there, and we have you know different encode profiles and and processing approaches to that different type of content where you know getting content out there two hours earlier so that it could still be there in prime time to be watched on a, on a VOD asset would be you know, hugely important and negate potential savings that you would get on ad advanced encoding efficiency, whereas assets that are, you know, a studio asset that we've gotten 45 days ahead of time and have all the time in the world, it's going to live there for months, if not years, take the time, get it to the, to the right quality standard as compressed as possible. So I think we'll see that kind of trade-off. Yeah. Oh. Is, Fang, is Fandango doing any, anything live? No, just no. TVOD, and uh, we have the same next day TV problem, so we do. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's all about efficiency and getting it out. Yeah. That's right. Yep. That's right. Okay. So it's interesting. Um, you mentioned that you use Moz uh, in, in various um, points of your distribution path, uh, PSNR, SSIM. Um, comment about you know, quality metrics. Um, how, you know, I'd be curious how you're using them in your respective workflows, um, where you've found they work, where they don't. You know, some of this is well known, but you know, it might be helpful for the audience to, um, you know, to hear 
um, you know, how you're using those quality metrics? We didn't design um, the mass score to troubleshoot some network related problems. Um, so sometimes it, it turns out that a 2% packet loss in a terrestrial network is okay, but for a live TV content, 2% packet loss is a huge, huge, uh, you know, uh, bad experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, but by using MOS scores at different injection points, we were able to isolate, uh, you know, where could the problem be? You know, is it a handoff point to at a, at a, at a teleport location uh, where the satellite's um, content is being offloaded? Um, that was one use case which we did not intend to, but the, the second use case which we really intended to was trying to get the feedback in terms of like, uh, yeah, if it's broadcast to the planes and the signals are coming down, um, are we decoding it right and how about the, the, the measurement in terms of like, um, you know, drop frames or, uh, or uh, the temperature spikes which you could be seeing uh, decoding those uh, HEVC uh, because we do live transcoding on the plane for the six channels. So, mm. so the temperature is also sort of a concern uh, because we have a mini data center on the plane. So and, and, uh, um, Can you comment what that <laughs> CPU is? I mean, is that... It, it's, a, it's an what, Intel, what's it's a standard in Intel architecture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we, we have a couple um, um, processors which, you, uh, which has some GPUs uh, yeah. uh, you know, utilized for transcoding. That's right. um, the GPU was not utilized for any of the processing, so we utilized it for transcoding. Um, it's standard architecture, but just that it's in an aviation enclosure. That, yeah. That's what makes it a little different. Um, but otherwise, uh, it's, it's comparable to... Uh, I assume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, um, um, going back to the, to the original question, I think the network problem is not something we intended to solve, but it solved it for us. Uh, but then the, the feedback in terms of like, uh, you know, what's the viewing experience on the plane collectively. It doesn't make sense if, if all the 100 nodes uh, watching the device report a drop frame, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to correlate to a, a drop frame on the plane itself, right? So, so we built some, some, um, some modeling based on, uh, on that by eliminating all those noisy chatters, uh, mm -hmm. um, which, which would come back and not give us any more information. We just congest the link, right? Yeah. So, uh, but going back, I think that, that's where uh, the mass score was really helpful in, in that aspect. Yeah. So. Yeah. Samir, PSNR, SSIM, your experience. Uh. <laughs> yeah, very similar in, in that regard. Like, you know, we, we, we've used, yeah, we rerun these PSNR and SSIM scores um, to calibrate the system uh, for quality control and, and basically we, we automate that process and then, then use it. And then, you know, we, we, we built some filters on top of it to figure out like what, what's, what's a normal, you know, normal set of issues that we're not going to look into and when that threshold goes above something then we'll actually have like somebody actually go in and figure out like, hey, uh, you know, maybe it was a bad delivery from the studio, there was something wrong, um, you know, was there, was there a bad encode that happens um, along the way, like, you know, and, and we put somebody like to fix that issue. Um, so we use it more, we, we use it more as a, as a, as a threshold. Uh, we, we, we calibrated it and then, you know, and we always kind of validate against it at multiple points. So we, we first run analysis on the file as soon as we get the, uh, the MEDS file. We create a PSNR, the SIM score, and then we, we validate it down the, down the line after it gets encoded and then after it gets delivered. And then we compare those values and see if it's within a, a given threshold. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we only at this point use for calibration. We, um, the, the amount of content that we're processing through um, upwards of about, uh, in our group, 75,000 assets a month. Yeah. It would it's be a lot. lot, a lot to run, you know, that, that kind of detailed analysis on, on everyone. We, we um, for certain, you know, we, we, we still have customers and the quality of content that we're dealing with where, you know, our, our, our quality scores by that golden eye who, you know, some of our content is, yeah. you know, is, is viewed from start to end of every single asset or, yeah. you know, manual five point QC check depending on the type of asset that goes through. Yeah, but that's we're, right. Yeah, but, yeah, we're not, we're not running that analysis on every asset. Yeah, no. that's right. And uh, in case someone's wondering, because probably a lot of people know that Beamer, that's what we invented, was a perceptual quality measure. We only use it inside our process, so that's why you know yeah. nobody's talking about it, because you don't have access to it. Um, I would like to, it looks like we have about seven minutes left. Um, so if there are questions, uh, the, the panel is happy to answer them. If there aren't, I, I have more prepared. So I'm gonna break here and ask, are there any questions? Yes. You mentioned that you set a threshold for accident quality, you set a threshold for PSNR, or like SSI, is that work? 
these are not kind of linear, so it's pretty easy. How do you see the threshold for this assignment? Because it's the higher the number you're mentioning, so I put the content and I put the different databases should be a different data. Yeah, it, it varies a lot. Obviously, um, you know, I mean, PSNR is our main our main focus. SSIM is is more of you know um, an additional layer for mainly for our high quality content that that we get into. Um, we have specific profiles where we're looking exactly at uh, at the SSIM um, you know threshold and and ratings, um, but it's it's more of an indicator. Uh, we use it more of an indicator than anything else. Um, but as you, as you said, PSNR is, is, is more linear, easy, easier to calibrate and have a threshold with. Yep. And it's not always really closely correlated it's, to human vision. Uh, exactly. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes? Uh, can I ask you to sort of take a five-year view on the bandwidth versus compression trade-off? I mean, currently you mentioned you just get a faster connection to the plane, and you know, the, the bandwidth is getting faster and cheaper, and storage is getting cheaper. So is this a problem? This year, in two years, or in five years, this is going to be you know, bright, shiny future, and then looking too cheap to be here, and nobody will care about it. So, um you know, we, we started 10 years back, right? So, so just going back and go, go um, our first service, which was an automatical based service, we, we just had three meg to the plane, right? And, and fast forward, um, you know, uh, 10 years, and now we're able to do 100 meg to the plane. So, so if you look at, look at the bandwidth curve, right? So we were pretty flat until like last year, and then like a hockey stick, you know, there was uh, technological improvements which has helped us get there, right? So we're sort of following the same path as uh, any terrestrial network. I think terrestrial network, be it a cable modem or, or any other technology, they follow the same path. Um, so, so to answer your question, yeah, there, there, there will be more choices and, and bandwidth is just going to become cheaper. But uh, again, uh, uh, I found that we, we find a way to fill that pipe up, uh -huh. right? So there's always some application yeah. and there's some device which is coming up um, which will, uh, you know, uh, fill it up. So I, I guess uh, you got to innovate on both sides, that's my point. So. Yeah, I, I, we're, we're seeing more, you know, 2018 being the year of 4K, you know, for a lot of our operators. And, you know, right now the internet's great for HD but you, you gotta use every trick that you can to start getting you know, those 4K streams that are compressed enough to get down there and, and start to have mass deployment. So again, maybe five years, I don't know if we're gonna be 8K, 16K, but at least, at least for 4K right now, compression is, is absolutely key. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? Yes. So, um, most of the passengers, what, what devices they carry is like an iPad, right? So, 4K doesn't make sense. I mean, uh, based on the distance you have, uh, uh, you know, in, in the cabin, because you're, you're sort of constrained, uh, constrained by the uh, the seat, uh, inner seat distance, right? So 4K doesn't make sense in that application, right? Uh, but uh, we use, uh, you know, SD content, uh, and that's pretty, uh, uh, you know, it's pretty good, like, uh, depending on what the profile is, it's, it's we've gone as high as 640p. Um, and uh, um, I, and the viewing experience has been uh, has been pretty good, um, just, just using that uh, 640p content, so. Yes, yeah, to the tablets. Okay, we have time for one more question, I believe. No? Okay. Well, join me in uh, thanking the panel. This was really a wonderful discussion, and thank you. Thank you.